Hello, everyone. In this episode of Hewlett Packard's Labs podcast from Research to Reality, I have a great honor and pleasure uh, to host Jim Greener, who is director of Silicon Design Labs in uh, Hewlett Packard Labs. Uh, welcome, Jim. Thank you, Dehan. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. So you are uh, leading a great team pursuing uh, many projects in silicon design. How did you uh, enter this area? Well, what is your history? Yeah, sure. So uh, I actually graduated from Colorado State University here in Colorado, in Fort Collins, Colorado, where I still live and work for HPE and Hewlett Packard Labs. And at the time, you know, it was the the beginning of um, kind of the, the PC revolution, if you will, and um, started in PA Risk microprocessor design for HP back then. Um, and uh, it's been now 26 years of doing silicon design in different businesses and capacities as uh, you know, Hewlett Packard Company and now Hewlett Packard Enterprises continue to grow and evolve over the years. Um, I remember when I was a uh, when I was, even before college when I was a kid the thing that got me interested in electrical engineering is the Apple PC had just come out and we started using them at school and they had a, a little video game um, where you had to program a robot to get through a maze by using boolean logic gates to design little circuits and I just thought that was fun and fascinating that's kind of what got me interested in uh, electrical engineering when I started in college. So interesting. You know, I would start doing the same thing if, if, if I were you, even today, let alone as a kid. Right. <laughs> so you're, you have multiple roles. You are a director of the lab, but you're also engaged in some technical leadership given your past background. Tell us a little bit about all these roles that you have. Yeah, sure. So the Silicon Design Lab uh, in Hewlett Packard Labs is a little unique within HPE in that we do everything, um, I like to say, from research to revenue. So we have, you know, uh, silicon engineers working in collaboration with labs on, you know, new device interfaces and technologies like Memristor and silicon photonics, as well as we're actually the organization that delivers the ProLiant security and management ASIC. Um, often referred to as the ILO ASIC, into all of you know, HP's volume ProLiant and Synergy servers. So we have this really broad capability and do everything from you know, interfacing to design services companies to uh, direct to foundry design with our foundry partners. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really interesting and, and it, it causes you know, us to be able to really bridge the gap um, from that research to revenue and help bring architectures and technologies along so that they would uh, make it into product. Silicon design has changed quite a bit over the years. Uh, can you tell us a little bit? I mean, you hinted with uh, uh, PA risk and all of that. We don't produce ourselves right. anymore. But So t t tell us a little bit. How did it come about that, that sudden change that it reduced? Yeah, sure. Actually, you know, Dehan, you say sudden change. It's been a really interesting uh, evolution over many years from my perspective. Silicon takes a lot of people in a long time to design. But one of the things we continue to see is, you know, just as with even software development, the level of abstraction that you can get into silicon with continues to get higher and higher. Um, you know, you can do C-level synthesis and whatnot. But you always find that if you need to optimize for performance or power or a specific market, um, you know, you need that that deep capability. So we've continued um, to kind of develop and evolve as the markets developed and evolved. You mentioned PA risk. Yeah, back when I started, it was, you know, Digital Equipment Corporation, Hewlett Packard Company, IBM, and, you know, Sun uh, Microsystems was kind of the new startup, newer startup that it was um, making all of their own risk and Unix and servers and workstations and everything. 
Well, you know, industries evolve um, and uh, HPE recognizing that we weren't necessarily going to be a foundry leader knew we needed to progress. So uh, we partnered with Intel for microprocessors. Um, and as you see, right, they've developed into the, the world leader in volume, but uh, we continue to see, um, you know, more uh, architectures and capabilities now working their way in. You have, uh, you know, NVIDIA and AMD and now even ARM. We recently at HPE announced uh, the introduction of an Ampere-based ARM server. And so you can see we've had to evolve and move through these various different technologies. Um, I actually moved from PA Risk to, to Superdome uh, system design and had to take that from uh, the RISC architecture through the Itanium and then into the x86 architecture, um, uh, partnering with Xeon. And uh, now we're looking, you know, more and more at purpose-built silicon as really, you know, virtualization and AI are the new um, frontiers, if you will, um, that continue to change the way we compute in the data center. As you were talking about this whole process, it occurred to me that while we were talking about the segregation of computer, you know, into vertical disaggregation into CPU, memory, etc. Actually, the whole industry has been desegregated that way. How has that changed your required skills? I mean, you don't build the whole system anymore. You work with all these memory, CPU, accelerator vendors. Have we become more of a system integrator as opposed to uh, system developer? Well, that's a really, really interesting and good question. So um, what you see is that where there's very high volume for an application and many people use the same application, it essentially commoditizes. And at that point, you know, something that was even true of, you know, Bill and Dave uh, Packard and or sorry, Hewlett and Packard, uh, who, who founded the company, is they were very keen on partnering. And so what I look at it as, you partner where the technology exists. Um, it's not innovative to build something that already exists. Really where we look at silicon design is, where is there a gap in the capability? That's why HPE develops a lot of fabrics that uh, connects a lot of these different compute elements, but everything's getting smarter. So, you know, you're embedding intelligence, be it ARM or RISC-V or something, you know, essentially into everything you build now, whether it's a, a switch or a NIC. Um, and so we look at it as partner where the technology exists and there are leaders in industry, um, like we don't, we don't have a fab, a fab anymore, right? TSMC is a fantastic fab and, and, um, and they don't vertically integrate. We love working with them. Um, and we also work with other fab partners, both for development and are looking at the changing ecosystem there, right? Uh, as Intel introduced the opportunity to work with them as a fab partner. Um, so partner where the technology exists and there are world leaders and innovate where you need new capabilities and especially vertical integration, right? This is where HPE is unique. We can bring everything from silicon to software to market and um, we have you know, decades of experience in doing so to integrate those solutions. Given the number of partners we are required to work with, why is it still critical, essential to have silicon design inside of our company? Yeah, so uh, working with your partners well, um, if you're an expert in the field, you are able to partner and deliver more consistently um, for your customers. And then, as I said, we have a long history of developing our partners as well. Um, we continue to want to be on the frontier of innovation and not uh, just, you know, keep producing the same commodity component uh, over and over again. And so we leave that, um, you know, commodity to the partners. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but we are able to transition technologies to partners um, and continue to uh, work with them to advance both their capability as well as then develop our own silicon 
that um, they can't necessarily advance. So think about newer and emerging markets, right? That's where you need an HPE to step in and really develop and lead the way before a volume partner can really go enter the market. Very, very interesting. Can you now be a little bit more specific? We were talking about gen in general about this whole area. Can you tell us about some specific projects? You hinted at ILO, perhaps there are others, Interconnects or wh whatever you prefer to talk about. Sure, yeah. Let me, um, let me talk about a couple that um, we've, uh, you know, we've disclosed um, uh, more publicly previously. So we are still in labs uh, developing memristor based technologies, and uh, we continue to, to develop um, security and other structures, uh, silicon interfaces around those memristor interfaces. Um, so we have a, 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 some exciting projects going on still in that area, as well, security and virtualization are you know absolutely huge. We know that you know every system and every network is constantly under attack. So where we look at these new novel approaches of devices like a memristor, we also then continue to expand the security capability uh, within ProLiant and other servers through our silicon innovation. And um, you're starting to see emerging standards in this area as well. And that's another place where we are uh, at HPE engaging and deciding where it is from a standard standpoint um, we should be involved. So, um, so yeah, so we, we continue to do everything from research to revenue, big focus on security and virtualization. Uh, and then as well with uh, AI and AI as a service emerging, we continue to look at that, um, but more on the, the deeper research front than on the active product development front in the silicon area. Very interesting. You have spoken about the past, about the present. Can you look a little bit in the future? Where do you think the silicon design is going? How important will it be given the end of Moore's law, end of dinner scaling, and all these doomsday predictions. Yes. So silicon is pervasive, right? Uh, look at what we experienced in the auto industry due to uh, COVID and supply chain shortages. The, um, every consumer product right, is, is silicon, uh, depends on silicon. And then the data center, of course, is run on silicon. So silicon is is huge and critical, and that's why you see you know even governments now getting involved with what do we need to do from an overall silicon industry and capability standpoint. Um, so what we're going to continue to see is we're going to see um, the levels of package and system integration uh, continue to increase. We'll also see standards like UCIE move from just, say, a processor interface or a networking interface to the chip level interface. And what I'd really like to see is rich ecosystems evolve, right? So that we can no longer be bound to um, purchasing a socket alone or developing our own socket in silicon, but where we can have multiple vendors and multiple um, innovators collaborating and contrib contributing within that silicon package, right? We like to say the package is the motherboard of the future. And um, that I think is absolutely going to be a big part of silicon and silicon innovation as we look forward. It occurred to me as you are talking that you start from materials, you were mentioning memristor and, and building these uh, materials, creating and designing them, then implementing chips, packaging, and then going even into solutions. So not only that um, you are touching all these components, it seems to me like silicon design that you're pursuing is the integral glue to all of them. It's much different than it used to be in the past. 
Right. Yeah. As, as a matter of fact, if you look at the evolution of you know HP and HP's products, the silicon we do today at Hewlett Packard Enterprise and products mostly and manages and interconnects. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't develop um, the the core compute silicon for most of our systems. We've been using partners. Um, and so that, that's because that's where the, that innovation was necessary. Mm -hmm. As we see these new architectures and programming models evolve, that's a place where um, everything, as I said before, is kind of getting smarter. And so in the research area, we have to look at how in the architecture and of the silicon and the system and the software, we integrate these different components, right? And so mm -hmm. you're hearing more and more about that heterogeneous compute. Yes. Um, and that's, you know, that's the new problem to solve. And, and, and to your point, it's not just a silicon problem. It is a solution problem because we all know that silicon without software gives you nothing at all. So it has to start with that software and that customer problem and then integrate with uh, silicon capabilities that advance the customer outcome. You mentioned multiple times um, that you work in labs, but at the same time, you are also contributing to product. So how does that work in your case? How does this transfer happen? Yeah, so um, we look at it, uh, we have uh, discrete teams and we use a bit of a, a funnel and stage gate process, right? So. In the product development, there's always the tyranny of the urgent. And so while we are a large silicon design organization, um, we use, we, we, we have to separate to some degree research and product. Otherwise you might you never get your product done or never really get the, the research done. Um, and then we use a stage gate process where we develop technologies. We uh, do a, a proof of concept um, and we might use, you know, um, custom fabrication techniques in Milpitas um, to build out a POC, partner that with an FPGA or a programmable device, and then start experimenting with open source software or even new software capabilities um, that would need to happen on top of that. And then, you know, as you, you move on, then you develop and you mature each part, um, or you end up with an IP nugget you know, this thing worked really, really well, and we're going to take it and transfer it into the product more quickly um, as a core component. You've seen that recently uh, with some of the security enhancements, uh, recently announced Project Aurora, right? That started in labs, software, and silicon collaboration, and um, made it into actual uh, product development and launch. Very, very, very interesting. Can you give us a sneak peek of any new innovations that are coming into the products that uh, that aren't confidential that you can share? Ah, uh, let's see. Something that isn't confidential. So let me go again um, to uh, a partner and uh, collaborate area. So we've uh, continued to develop interfaces in silicon and CMOS for, as I said, various different components. We have rich research and partnerships now in, uh, in photonics, and that continues to be a key future area um, where um, you know, integration and collaboration uh, will, will bring about some new product and inter interconnect capabilities. Um, I also mentioned, of course, um, you know, making things smarter. So you will continue to see, um, you know, more ARM cores in the devices. And then the long-term vision with HPE's journey to offer everything as a service and grow, develop, and support our GreenLake business um, is, you know, you will have uh, distributed, you know, containers and or uh, compute um, uh, software elements or applications 
you know, maybe everywhere in the system. So these are a lot of the advancements that we're working on and we'll start making it into product as we uh, finalize the technology and the use case and mature it. You keep on mentioning partners, but there's even larger ecosystem. There's uh, also universities, there's government uh, and uh, there are customers themselves who in many ways are part of this ecosystem with their requirements. So how do you work in this ecosystem? Yeah, so that's uh, that's really interesting. This is where it's nice to be part of an organization uh, like labs. So we have um, university partnerships and of course we have a, a, a rich set of uh, different universities that we have alumni with um that work here and so we keep our uh industry or sorry our university um connections and partnerships for both talent pipeline and technology collaboration uh going that way uh, we do of course hpe has many federal bids and government partners which also brings about uh, collaboration and innovation opportunities um, and then, you know, as well, as, as we talked about multiple times, there are the, the business partnerships where we uh, might be looking for um, a partner that would want to co-invest in bringing a technology to market. Um, and we've done a number of those over the years as well. Since we have started with universities, can you tell us a few remaining technical and research challenges that you can ask of universities. I'm sure a number of professors may be watching this podcast, so this would be a good message for them. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I have a, uh, I have two key um, uh, requests and, uh, I, you know, I guess I would say um, opportunities for the universities. Obviously, as we've talked about, right, silicon engineering compute is pervasive in everything we do. Um, and so, you, you know, you look at the market right now for talent and um, it's very, very hot. So uh, we went through this. It was actually a lot like this in the 90s um, before the tech bubble. So I see a key role in the university, right, is in producing talent. Um, and especially in this area. And then as we look at the evolving and changing um, demographics um, and the global industry, we need to make sure that's um, a diverse um, talent pool as well. On the technology side, um, we need this talent pool to be well-versed um, in the growth areas, right? And this includes, of course, HPC, AI, and Edge. And then while engineers become more uh, specialized because of um, uh, you know, engineering versus say computer science and software design, we need to continue to drive integration skills because again, that's where the real outcomes uh, come about. So those are the, the three things. I actually uh, sit on the board for the electrical computer engineering uh, 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 department here in, in at Colorado State University. And those are some of the things we work on there. And as well, I look um, to the other universities that we partner with uh, to work on as well. We have been talking about um, how silicon design has changed. On the software side, we have uh, a strong movement in open source. There's equivalent of open compute uh, with RISC-V and others yeah. Uh, do you think that these movements will change silicon design the way the open source has changed the software development area? Yeah. So what does my crystal ball say? Um, you know, I watched and um, worked as, you know, even HP helped lead from proprietary Unix to open standards, right, using x86 and Linux and how that really changed the industry. Um, silicon is still different from software. Um, you build a discrete component that has a finite lifetime. 
Um, it's, uh, you know, it's harder to update, <laughs> obviously, and replace. Um, so, you know, how much the open silicon opportunities change the industry still remains to be seen because it's going to move more slowly than, let's say, some of those software opportunities. But I do fundamentally believe that you know, as you saw Linux um, as an open sourced operating system and all of the derivatives spring out and come about, we'll see um, RISC-V uh, become uh, a developing architecture where you have businesses that will offer, you know, capabilities and services around RISC-V and it'll lower, it'll speed the time to innovation for silicon. And so these technologies will be adopted. Um, it's just a matter of, I think, how long it takes from a silicon perspective. The other place, and you mentioned open compute. Um, obviously, HP is very active uh, with open compute. Um, we like to partner with OCP at the system level uh, to um, share as much as we can for components security and technologies to make it easier for our customers and to leverage um, those those partnerships and, and the volume wherever it's possible. But then, um, you know, the, these interfaces, these standard interfaces like CXL and UCIE and their development is the other place where um, the continued uh, expansion of the capability within the standards to solve these new problems that will also really help drive these innovation opportunities. You know, I have been active uh, in IEEE and when I would visit industry, they usually say we benefit from IEEE in terms of conferences, publications, sometimes future directions. Yeah. How is the area of silicon design and your team, how are you all benefiting from professional organizations such as ACM, IEEE, Usenix and others? Yeah, so uh, you know, it's I mean, it's it, silicon um, is a design discipline within you know electrical and computer engineering. So it benefits in the the same ways, um, you know, through the standards participation, through the uh, the publication uh, and the sharing of knowledge, and then actually a big one uh, for me that IEEE has been is a uh, group that unites students and professional communities, right? Um, it brings uh, companies, academia, and disciplines together. And I always find that to be, you know, an exciting opportunity for in innovation. Um, when you share problems and opportunities, and um, and actually, you know, IEEE has been a big part of that uh, for uh, for me and my team. How are labs and how are you addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion? Very important topic, and I know we're doing a lot, but I'd be curious on your perspective. Yeah, so, uh, you know, as I said, um, you know, the workforce needs to grow and it needs to be diverse just as the, the world is. We've seen, you know, some of the challenges, uh, even in, uh, say, AI training, where uh, you, where you, it may lack diversity in the data set. Um, and so what we're doing is um, obviously actively working with the universities and professional communities to promote this. Um, I actually volunteer uh, for a group um, of high-tech companies in the Fort Collins area, and we host what we call a day of industry here on the, the site where we bring um, you know, first year and diverse students who might not necessarily normally be drawn to a, an engineering or science and te technology field. And we expose them and we try and uh, create networks uh, for them to uh, enter and succeed in the engineering area. So, you know, it, it really is a, um, an education through professional, uh, effort because your talent pipeline we find in engineering starts at a at a pretty young age um, in in science and math. Uh, so uh, every way that we can engage with uh, the the educational and professional communities uh, to develop 
the the talent pipeline that's what we're focused on great great suggestion i mean uh, i really appreciate it and 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 it's truly beneficial to everyone you can just see how important it is it's not just doing lip service it's really profoundly important for our business to have diverse um, workforce I usually end these uh, podcasts on a personal note, and almost in every single case, people grew up uh, on the East Coast, you know, lived uh, or got school in the Midwest, then came to California or vice versa. You are a unique person who grew up in Fort Collins, who works, even who went to school in Fort Collins and even work now there. So how does it feel? Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's been an interesting, uh, you know, 25-year uh, career at HP and HPE in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, you know, essentially, we, um, we seeded, this team seeded the silicon design. We have an Intel, a Broadcom, and an AMD site, you know, essentially on the four corners of the street here. Those were all essentially started by HP Heritage. Um, the uh, the thing that I feel so fortunate uh, for is being to live in a, a place like Colorado. I'm an avid rock climber uh, during the summer months and in the gym uh, during the winter, and I, I love to ski um, during the winter as well. And so I've always enjoyed the four changing seasons and the non-work activities that uh, Colorado and the Rocky Mountains provide, um, but being able to live in a place like that while doing the coolest technology and watching um, and helping with market and technology evolution and changes um, has been the really exciting part for me. So I often joke that, you know, I've, I never, I've never gone anywhere <laughs> since I stayed here at Fort Collins, but you know, it's, it's allowed me the opportunity as well, working for HPE to, to travel the world and have partners, you know, in Asia and India and Europe. Um, and then, you know, uh, partners from East coast to West coast, uh, certainly in, in business in Silicon. And every time I go somewhere, I love uh, learning about the local uh, communities um, and cultures. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I still love living in Colorado, though. And so it's kept me kept me here all these years. Sounds extremely rewarding. Just like with that game, you almost make me feel want to go and work in Silicon Design. There you go. <laughs> uh, I, I, I hope the new generations of uh, engineers will feel the same way. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. I, I learned tons from you, both about history and sneak peeks into the future. I hope everybody else uh, will enjoy as much as I have. Great. Thank you very much, Dan.